a war to Lebanon potentially apocalyptic. And Bolivia coup attempt fails after drawing global condemnation. This is World Today, I'm Brenda LePaul. The outgoing United Nations humanitarian chief warned that the spread of the Israel-Hamas war to Lebanon would be potentially apocalyptic as fighting raged in the southern Gaza Strip. Martin Griffiths described Lebanon as the flashpoint beyond all flashpoints, especially its southern border with Israel, which has seen daily cross-border violence since 7 October. We are worried about the potential for further, further tragedy and deaths and um, uh, the events in the West, West Bank as well as, of course, the threats and the possibilities in Lebanon. And we have been talking for quite a long time, haven't we, in the political community about the possible regionalization of this war and the possible further misery for the people of Palestine that is part of that. The UN's Griffith spoke as witnesses reported intense fighting between Israel and Hamas in Gaza's southern city of Rafah amid the fears of a wider war. Germany yesterday echoed a Canadian warning from the day before, urging their citizens in Lebanon to leave the country. With the conflict nearing its 10th month, Israel's top ally, the United States, warned of the risks of a major conflict with Hezbollah following an escalation in threats after months of cross-border fire. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said another war between Israel and Hezbollah could easily become a regional war with terrible consequences for West Asia. And on a related note, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan accused Western powers of backing what he said were Israeli plans to attack Lebanon and spread war throughout the region. He said Israel is now setting its sights on Lebanon and the Western powers behind the scenes are patting Israel on the back and even supporting the regime. Netanyahu's battle's resolve to fight the region to the region plans are clear. The region will be a big disaster. The region will be a big disaster. The region will be a big disaster. His remarks came as concerns soared over escalating threats and ongoing cross-border exchanges of fire between Israeli forces and Lebanon's Iran-backed Hezbollah, fueling fears it could descend into fully-fledged war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had said Israeli forces are now winding up the most intense part of the Gaza war and will redeploy to the northern border. Last week, Israel said its plans for an offensive in Lebanon were approved and validated. Meanwhile, an Israeli strike wounded five people when it hit a two-story building in the town of Nabatia in southern Lebanon. Lebanon's national news agency said Israel carried out some 10 strikes on border regions. It said an Israeli strike destroyed the building in Nabatia around 10 p.m. local time, adding that the five people who were in the vicinity of the structure were wounded and taken to hospital. There was no immediate comment from the Israeli military on the attack. Some 481 people have died in Lebanon as a result of the Israel-Hezbollah clashes in 7 October, including 94 civilians. Israel and the United States have made progress towards resolving a rift over U.S. weapon shipments of the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu publicly accused President Joe Biden's administration of slowing down deliveries. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant met top officials over three days in Washington as he voiced hope for quietly working through disagreements with Israel's vital ally, drawing an implicit contrast to Netanyahu's more confrontational approach. During the meeting with Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, Gallant said they made significant progress, including the topic of force buildup and munition supply to Israel. The United States in early May froze a shipment that included 2,000-pound bombs and Biden warned of a further halt as he pressed Israel not to carry out a wide-scale military assault on Rafah. 
A senior U.S. administration official said the United States had sent more than $6.5 billion in weapons to Israel since 7 October. Over in Taiwan, its defense ministry said it had detected 35 Chinese military aircraft and seven naval vessels around the island in a 24-hour window. China claims Taiwan is part of its territory and has said it will never renounce the use of force to bring the self-ruled democracy under its control. It has stepped up pressure on Taipei in recent years and held military drills around the island following last month's inauguration of Taiwan President Lai ching -te. Taipei's defense ministry said during those drills, Beijing sent 62 military aircraft around Taiwan in the highest single-day total this year. A European Union bid to breathe new life into stalled negotiations between Serbia and Kosovo fell through, with Serbia's president and the Kosovo prime minister failing to meet as planned. The sit-down was supposed to happen nearly a year after the bid's arrivals last met, following repeated rounds of unsuccessful negotiations. Both Serbia President Aleksandr Vucic and Kosovo Prime Minister Albin Kurti had separate meetings with EU representatives. But according to EU Foreign Affairs Chief Josep Borrell, no progress in implementation of the agreement could be achieved. Borrell said the EU would continue putting all its efforts and capacity at the service of the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia. We cannot want a normalization at the European Union alone on the relation between the parties if they themselves cannot agree on how to move forward. We cannot substitute them on the implementation of the agreement. Our role is to assist and to support the parties in their efforts under the dialogue process. And this is what we are still committed to continue doing. Borrell said these efforts will continue next week when he will host the two negotiators in Brussels. NATO 32 nations appointed outgoing Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte as the alliance's next chief, heading him the job at a crucial moment with Russia on the march in Ukraine and U.S. elections looming. Rutte will take over from Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg on 1st October after major powers agreed on his nomination ahead of a summit of NATO leaders in Washington next month. Stoltenberg said Rutte is a true transatlanticist, a strong leader and a consensus builder, adding that he knows he is leaving NATO in good hands. The seasoned Dutch leader, whose 14 years tenure leading the Netherlands is set to end within weeks, is seen as a safe pair of hands capable of uh, stewarding NATO through perilous times. His appointment was welcomed by leaders across the 75-year-old alliance, including British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who call it a good choice for freedom and security. Rutte will face the challenge of sustaining Allies' support for Ukraine's fight against Russia's invasion, while guarding against NATO's being drawn directly into a war with Moscow. He will also have to contend with the possibility that NATO skeptic Donald Trump may return to the White House after November's U.S. presidential election. And still ahead, at least 20 injured in cable car accident in Colombia. Stay with us. That later, but first, Bolivia's army chief was arrested after sending soldiers and tanks to take up positions in front of government buildings in what President Luis Arce called an attempted coup d'etat. The troops and tanks entered Plaza Murillo, a historic square where the presidency and Congress are situated, prompting global condemnation of an attack on democracy. One of the tanks tried to break down a metal door of the presidential palace. Surrounded by soldiers and eight tanks, the now dismissed Army Chief General Juan Jose Zuniga said the armed forces intended to restructure democracy, to make it a true democracy that is not run by the same few people for 30 to 40 years. However, shortly thereafter, soldiers and tanks were seen pulling back from the square. Zuniga was also captured and forced into a police car as he addressed reporters outside a military barracks. 
Arce said from a balcony of the government palace that no one can take away the democracy that the country has won. Earlier, he urged the Bolivian people to organize and mobilize against the coup d'etat in favor of democracy. He also swore in Jose Wilson Sanchez as the new military commander, replacing Zuniga. Kenyan President William Bruto said that a bill containing contentious tax hikes would be withdrawn, dramatically reversing course after more than 20 people were killed. In clashes, with police and parliament was ransacked by protesters opposed to the legislation. The initially peaceful demonstrations were sparked last week by the 2024 finance bill and took Ruto's administration by surprise. As rallies gathered momentum across the country, the Gen Z-led protests spiraled into violence on Tuesday when police fired live bullets at the crowds outside parliament, leaving the complex ransacked and partly ablaze. Having reflected, on the continuing conversation around the content of the Finance Bill 2024, and listening keenly to the people of Kenya, who have said loudly that they want nothing to do with this Finance Bill 2024, I concede, and therefore I will not sign the 2024 finance bill and it shall subsequently be withdrawn and I have agreed with these members that that becomes our collective position. While accepting the finance bill's withdrawal, Ruto directed immediate austerity cuts across the presidency and executive branch to reduce expenditure, including slashing funds for travel, vehicles and renovations. He also vowed to prioritize fighting corruption, a demand from protesters. Sri Lanka has clinched a restructuring deal with key bilateral lender China and other nations, covering up to $10 billion in debt, a critical step towards recovery after a 2022 financial crash. Sri Lanka won. The Parshika Naimi and Samaga. The agreement is expected to revise stalled infrastructure projects, including a Japanese-funded airport expansion and a new mass transit light rail in the capital. President Ranil Vikramasinghe said the deal with official creditor committee nations was reached in Paris, while an agreement with the Exim Bank of China was signed in Beijing. He also said Sri Lanka secured a moratorium on repayments until 2028. Sri Lanka defaulted on its foreign debt in April 2022 after running out of foreign exchange and the unprecedented economic crisis forced then-President Gotabaya Rajapaksa to step down. Vikramasinghe has said the nation was bankrupt when he took over almost two years ago, and he hoped the International Monetary Fund bailed out of $2.9 billion he secured last year would be the island's last. And in Colombia, a cable car fell to the ground, killing at least one passenger and injuring at least 20 other people in Colombia's Medellin. Administrative Director of Disaster Reach Management in Medellin, Carlos Quintero, said the cable car was part of the public transportation service Metro Cable. According to Quintero, the cable car hit another cable car before crashing almost 10 meters down to the ground. The accident took place in a popular station, affecting the K-Line service. Rescue teams and firefighters were dispatched to the area to assist the 11 passengers of the cable car, but one of them later died at a local hospital. Local media said another 10 people near the crash area were also injured, including a taxi driver hit by parts of the cable car structure. Authorities are investigating the causes of the accident. 
A new deadlier strain of Mpox that transmits more easily between people is killing children and causing miscarriages in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Researcher at the University of Rwanda, Jean-Claude Udahimuka, said all countries should be preparing for the new strain before it spreads to other places. A global outbreak of a new strain of Mpox, the CLAD-2 strain, in 2022 spread to more than 110 countries. But there have been regular outbreaks of the CLAD-1 strain in Africa since it was first detected in Democratic Republic of Congo in 1970. People in Africa normally caught CLAD-1 from infected animals, such as when eating bushmeat. But Jean-Claude Udahimuka said something was different about an Mpox outbreak detected among workers in the remote mining Congolese town of Kamituga in September last year. Testing revealed it was a mutated variant of the original strain called CLAT-1B, and it is the most dangerous strain so far. Researchers said 5% of adults and 10% of children who get the strain die. The strain has also caused numerous miscarriages, and researchers are studying its long-term effect on fertility. More than 1,000 cases of CLAD 1B have been reported in South Kivu province, and there are more than 20 new cases every week in Kamituga alone, with the number keep on rising. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange returned home to Australia to start life as a free man after admitting he revealed U.S. defense secrets in a deal that unlocked the door to his London prison cell. Assange landed on a chilly Canberra evening in a private jet, the final act of an international drama that led him from a five-year stretch in the high-security Belmarsh prison in Britain to a courtroom in a U.S. Pacific Island territory and finally home. The Australian raised a fist as he emerged from the plane door, striding across the tarmac to give a hug to his wife Stella that lifted her off the ground and then to embrace his father. Assange's long battle with U.S. prosecutors came to an unexpected end in Saipan, in the northern Mariana Island, where a judge accepted his guilty plea on a single count of conspiracy to obtain and disseminate national defense information. The remote courtroom was chosen because of the 52-year-old's unwillingness to go to the continental United States and because of its proximity to Australia. As part of behind-the-scenes legal negotiations with the U.S. Justice Department, he was sentenced to the time he had already served in London, five years and two months, and given his liberty. And in sports, Georgia staged historic Euro shock by beating Portugal. Stay tuned. And of course, Georgia are through to the last 16 of Euro 2024 after a 2-0 win over Portugal, a historic triumph in the former Soviet Republic's first appearance at a major international tournament. Kvica Kvaratskhelia gave Georgia a shock lead against the second-string Portugal team with just over a minute on the clock in Gezelkerken. Georgi Mikautadze then ensured Georgia would claim the biggest football victory in the Black Sea nation's history with a 57-minute penalty. Willy Sanyo's team qualified from Group F as one of the four best third-place finishers, which set up a daunting clash with red-hot Spain on Sunday. Portugal had already qualified for the next round as group winners, which swept Turkey aside to guarantee first place last weekend. Regardless, Portugal will face Slovenia on Monday and, saving any injuries, coach Roberto Martinez will have a mostly rested first 11 to call upon. And speaking of the match, forward Kvaratskhelia said Georgia's miracle qualification for the last 16 was the best day of his life. He said this win was even better than winning the Serie A title with Napoli last year. Another historic triumph with an unfancied team. <laughs> Meanwhile, Portugal coach Roberto Martinez insisted his side had not underestimated Georgia, but admitted they were deservedly beaten in their final group game.
no, we didn't. We didn't underestimate Georgia. But but it is true that Georgia was Georgia were playing the the game of the history. It's the opportunity to qualify, first time in the European Championships, and we were playing the last game when we are already top of the group. Uh, it was difficult for us to match the same intensity, but that's not underestimating um, our our players that they are in the national team. They are players that they are of the highest level, and it's not underestimating Georgia. And in another Group F match, Turkey overcame stiff resistance from a 10-man Czech Republic in a 2-1 win with goals from Hakan Chaladolu and Jeng Tosun to set up a Euro 2024 last 16 clash with Austria and send their opponents home. The Czechs, quarter-finalists at the last tournament, needed victory to stand any chance of advancing, but the 20-minute dismissal of midfielder Antonin Barak for a harsh second yellow card hit them hard. In a chaotic end to the game, Czech Republic's Tomasz Skori was also given a red card in a melee at the final whistle. The referees showed 18 cards in total, 2 red and 16 yellow, to set a new Euros record. Both teams pressed hard from the start in a raucous atmosphere on a hot night, with Turkish fans marching to the game and outnumbering the Czechs thanks to their huge diaspora in Germany. Turkey finished second behind Portugal and will play Austria in the last 16 on 2nd July in Leipzig. In Group E, Belgium qualified for the last 16 after a goalless draw with Ukraine, who had exited the tournament despite all four teams in the group finishing level on four points. Belgium supporters reacted furiously at the final whistle in Stuttgart, with captain Kevin De Bruyne appearing to tell his teammates not to go over to applaud them as the whistles and jeers grew louder. They will play France in the next round and have landed themselves on the toughest side of the draw, which also features hosts Germany, Spain and Portugal. Yeah, we, we go for, for winning. We go to win. We are here and we qualified for this Euro to be to be part of these best teams. Now we are part of the best 16 teams. We will face a top team. And this is the reason why we qualified. Otherwise, we could stay at home. So these are the games uh, we are looking for. And everything is possible. War on Ukraine's brave run came to an agonizing end as they became the first team since the tournament increased to 24 teams not to progress with four points. It was the first time ever at the European Championship all four teams in the same group had gone into the final round of games locked on the same number of points. In the meantime, Ukraine fans outside the stadium in Stuttgart said they were proud even though their team were eliminated from Euro 2024. I mean, this particular game we play, we play quite good. We play as we wanted to play, which is good. And uh, as for the Euro itself, I mean, I don't know, the determination, I guess. Yeah, so we fight it till the end. We lose. That happens sometimes. It's okay. <laughs> to have peace. For us, it's important to say we want to have peace, we want to have life, a life. It's normal life. Ukrainian people love football. It's here and we want to have peace today because we, uh, we are very, very sad about the war. All four teams finished level on four points in Group E, but Ukraine finished bottom on goal difference after damaging 3-0 loss to Romania in their opening match. And moving on to tennis, Emma Raducanu registered her first ever victory over a top 10 player at the Eastbourne International, saving a match point on the way to upsetting second seed, Jessica Pegula. Former US Open champion Raducanu edged a tight second set tie break to level the match against her American opponent and held the nerve to win for 6 7 6 7 5 after a major wobble in the decider. Raducanu, who saved a match point in the second set tie break, appeared to be cantering towards victory when she led 5 2 in the third set. But Pegula, who won the Berlin Grass Court tournament last week, broke twice to level. The former British number one, now ranked 168 in the world, carved out a break of her own to edge ahead again and survive a clutch of break points to seal the win, setting up a quarterfinal tie with Daria Kasatkina. 
Britain's Katie Poulter, meanwhile, continued her fine form on grass by putting out fifth seat and former champion Yelena Ostapenko, 6-4-7-5. The British number one who won the Nottingham tournament earlier this month will take on third seed Jasmine Paulini in the second round. And in the men's event, Taylor Fritz's quest for a third Eastbourne title is on track as he put on a serving masterclass against Thiago Sabothville. The American completely dominated on his serve, sealing victory with an ace in a 7-6-6-3 victory. Up next for Fritz is rising Chinese star, okay. Shang Jun Fritz, two sets allowed, 7-6-6-3. Two-time quarter-finalist and third seed Alexander Bublik crashed out in straight sets. Defeats to lucky loser Alexander Vukic, 6-4-6-4. The Australian will face Japanese qualifier Yoshihito Nishioka in the quarter-finals. And in cycling, Primoz Roglic and his team unveiled their latest kits with their new sponsor, Red Bull. Joining team Bora Hansgrohe, just in time for the two de France. Roglic will be the newly formed Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe's best hope for a Tour de France win as a three-time Vuelta Espana and one-time Giro d'Italia winner looks to collect a major cycling prize still eluding him. Uh, you are uh, the, the, the key. I mean, yes, all of us uh, is playing a key role. I mean, uh, all, all of the eight guys. Uh, and uh, yeah, definitely, we, we have to go out there. We, we have to we have to do our best. Uh, and uh, yeah, in that case, for sure, we will be we will be happy with the with the result. The Slovenian who joined the team this season will be accompanied by Jay Hindley, Alexander Vlasov, Mateo Sobrero, Dani Van Popol, Marco Hala, Nico Denz, Bob Jungles to a quest. The route crosses the Alps twice with seven mountain slocks, features a first ever race on the white gravel and ends with an eye-catching individual time trial from Monaco to Nice along the French Riviera. Broadcast live in more than 100 countries, the first four days are drenched with Italian colour, starting with the Renaissance beauty of Florence. Before the race crosses the Rubicon River, takes in the seaside sites at Rimini, passes along the Via Romagna Road into Bologna, and eventually moves out of yeah, Fiat capital Turin towards France for the remaining 17 stages. And that's it from us today in our top story. Spread of Gaza war to Lebanon, potentially apocalyptic. Melissa Tonight comes on at 8.30 p.m. today on TV1 at Salon Brita RTM. Do join us then. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I'm Brendan Paul. Thank you for watching. Take care.